He who draws the sword from the stone, he shall be king. Excalibur. With his starry eyes. <laughs>Welcome to the Bottled Imp. My name is Ken Boyta and this is a fantasy review show. Now, today we are in a temporary location. Imp Towers has moved, so you probably noticed it's looking slightly different. But that's a good thing, surely. Change is inevitable. Anyway, today we're going to be looking at John Borman's 1981 film Excalibur. So, let's take a look. <laughs> we all know the King Arthur story, don't we? It's a legend, of course you do. Well, bits and pieces of it. Over the years I've seen films, I've read a few books, but not all of them contain every single element. Well, this time John Borman has tried to do that. It's basically based on Thomas Mallory's 15th century romance, Le Mort, I can never pronounce this, Le Mort d'Arthur. As you can probably tell, my French isn't brilliant. Obviously that means the death of Arthur, I think. Yes, it does. Anyway, so you can probably tell it's going to be a sprawling epic. So let's have a look at it. Basically, my first impressions when I watched it was years ago. I was, oh, I don't know, probably about 15, 16. And the same impressions then, I watched it recently, are still with me. The one thing to note is how gritty and dark it really is. And something that parallels that really by today's standards is Game of Thrones. I don't think Lord of the Rings is... It is gritty, but it's kind of gritty in a slightly different way. Game of Thrones and Excalibur, same sort of grittiness and darkness. And obviously that's a good thing. It's really blood, guts, sex. It's no nonsense. And that is John Borman's vision. Um, I would kind of parallel it in some respects to Blade Runner um, in terms of the tone. I wouldn't say it's quite as good a film as Blade Runner, but I would say that back in 81, because obviously that was roughly the same time as Blade Runner, it probably had the same sort of effect uh, that Blade Runner did on sci-fi that Excalibur had on fantasy in terms of, I think it made people sit up and take fantasy a bit more seriously than some of the Sword and Sandals films that we had um, back in the day. So yeah, gritty, blood, guts, all that kind of thing. There are good themes that run through Excalibur. Uh, the main one is really power, and it's power and the lust for power, and also how power can corrupt. Now, we, we kind of know all that, but also how uh, temptation, if you are a pure character, you'll still be tempted by power, um, and that's kind of how they explore this. The land in Excalibur, obviously, it's you know, supposedly historical, uh, is divided is several kingdoms again another parallel to Game of Thrones and so they're looking for a champion they're looking for that one king to reunite them and of course that you know is ultimately a quest for power um, and you know you've got to look at the motives behind why somebody would want that power and in this case with King Arthur he obviously wants it for a good reason but then you know there are temptations along the way for him um, another uh, theme main theme is faith and faith that you know the land is going to be just and fair that that will win out in the end um faith that as i say the, the land will be united um and what kind of united land will it be will it be a just land also there's the faith that things can be reborn um that things move on and faith that people can forgive and also redemption those are some of the themes in excalibur um, primarily though, I found, re-watching this recently, there's a lot of hope in the film. There's a lot of hope that of what could be. This is a land we're going to forge together. What could it be like? And it's one of those films where you kind of know that in some respect it's a doomed hope. But nevertheless, the characters still believe in it and they go on their quests probably knowing that it's not necessarily going to work out. Um, and also using something like Excalibur, that's such a, a massive symbol. It's very symbolic. It's that rally cry. And a lot of fantasy obviously has got at least one thing that everybody can rally around and, and use that as the symbol for hope. Um, the plus points in the film, 
as I say, I've mentioned it before, the dark, the grittiness, the, the, the tone of it is really beautifully done. Um, it's not cheesy in any way. The themes, great themes, good exploration of those themes um, from all the characters. All the characters are three-dimensional as well, which is really good. The vast storylines, it's not just one story. It's not just about King Arthur and how he became King Arthur. It's also about... Um, the gathering of his of his knights of the round table but it's not just about that it's about the decline as well of the knights and how treachery and betrayal can you know enter into any family situation because after all they call themselves a brotherhood um so again the the, the vast storylines are brilliant there's other storylines as well and um, there's the merlin and morgana storyline uh, again that kind of good versus evil but more on a, a spiritual level if you like more uh, of, of an otherworldliness, um, and also I liked I liked the fact that it takes you from Arthur as a boy straight through into him being King Arthur right through to his old age. So um, they're the plus points. The downsides are some of the actors, well, their performances are a little bit you know a little bit needy. Um, they're not brilliant, but there are some very good performances in. The other thing is the pacing. The pacing does lag a little bit, but I maybe forgive that because it, you know, 81, what's that, nearly over 30 years ago, isn't it? Um, and then saying it sprawls, there are lots of different vast storylines. On the whole, John Borman manages to hold it all together. Occasionally, you'll think, actually, this is going a bit off, you know, in too many directions. Um, as I say, some of the acting is very good. The uh, Nigel Terry, who plays King Arthur, is an interesting choice. Nowadays, I don't think he'd be cast. He is good looking, but he's not, which is a good thing. But I don't think, for me, he doesn't quite do it. It is good, but he doesn't quite do it. And in some shots, it really reminded me of uh, Griff Rhys Jones and a cross between Griff Rhys Jones and Hugh Grant. So if you don't know Griff Rhys Jones, check out Alas Smith and Jones. Um, the one that steals the show, though, is Merlin, and Nicole Williamson is brilliant. He's equally bonkers, flippant, scary, mysterious, otherworldly as Merlin. Just what you'd expect. The Gandalf figure. Um, really good, and he's obviously very key to the legend uh, of King Arthur, so casting that was crucial. Helen Mirren makes a brilliant performance as, uh, as the evil Morgana. Plus, you get Liam Nielsen. He turns up. Nelson, how do you pronounce his name? Neeson, thank you. <laughs> I knew I'd balls that one up. Liam Neeson, yeah, he crops up. A very young looking Liam Neeson. Very good. Uh, and also, oh, Patrick Stewart, he turns up. Again, a young looking kind of. He's always looked older. But anyway, a young looking Patrick Stewart adds a bit of gravitas to the film. So, on the whole, Excalibur. Yeah, I would recommend watching it. It is a solid film. It really, for me, sets the tone of fantasy for the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years uh, in terms of film. And it does set out to, it does achieve what it sets out to do, and that's bring lots of strands of the Arthurian legend together and weaves it in a co mostly cohesive story. Uh, the production values are very good. The uh, special effects are excellent, really add to it. There's nothing ultimately, you know, hokey about it. Um, yeah, interesting to note that uh, John Borman did actually want to do the Merlin legend rather than concentrate on King Arthur and it was way back in 1969 he had this idea. So he wrote a script, he tried selling it to the studios, they weren't interested, but one big studio did offer him Lord of the Rings. Wow. Imagine what he would have done with that. We probably wouldn't, would we have had Peter Jackson's versions? I don't know. But if you watch the film, bear that in mind because there is that kind of epic, sprawling nature of it. Um, I'm sure he would have done a really good job with Lord of the Rings as well. So, my overall view, definitely go and watch it. Own it. It's one of my favourite fancy films. Um, in fact, I must do a top 10 fancy film list. That'll be one of the episodes we do. So, go and watch it. Go and enjoy it. <laughs> so thanks for watching hope you enjoyed that uh, review of Excalibur let us know what you think of the film if you've seen it already if not watch it and then let us know leave some comments obviously you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and the usual stuff in to do with social media so check us out like us subscribe and that's pretty much it we'll be doing some more reviews so check us out every Friday hope you enjoy it see you next week fellow bottled imps Thank you.